Today on the Matt Walsh Show, California's creepiest groomer politician pulls a Jussie Smollett, and it's perhaps the dumbest and most blatant hoax of all time. Also, speaking of creepy groomers, Biden's BDSM dog fetishist energy official gets put on administrative leave. A new film pushing gender ideology on children is sponsored by pharmaceutical companies. I wonder why I am persecuted by the audience despite having fairly fulfilled the terms of my anime deal. And director James Cameron warns that testosterone is a poison, quote unquote, that must be purged out of men. All of that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. Roe v. Wade has been overturned, and this battle is now finally leaving D.C. and going to the grassroots. No group in America is better positioned than 40 Days for Life. With about 1 million volunteers in 1,000 cities, 40 Days for Life holds peaceful vigils outside of abortion facilities. They have a larger presence in blue states, with California being their largest state. Some former abortion facility directors say that these vigils can cause the abortion no-show rate to go as high as 75%, which is detrimental to their abortion business. These law-abiding vigils have closed many abortion businesses in America, and nearly half of those closed abortion facilities were in liberal cities where abortion will remain legal, including closures in San Francisco, Chicago, and Seattle. 40 Days for Life is effectively changing hearts and minds in the grassroots to end abortion. You can check out their locations, podcasts, and free magazine at 40daysforlife.com. And uh, remember that now is not the time to slow down or back away in the fight for life. It's never been more important. So for more information on 40 Days for Life, go to 40daysforlife.com. Well, there's been some renewed attention this week on that parasitic organism attached to the western part of the nation known as California. The state of California is, in many ways, really a tragic American story. Geographically, it's terrifically beautiful. Uh, it was discovered, explored, settled, civilized, and conquered with great effort and tremendous sacrifice over the course of this country's early history. It was once one of our prize possessions, a sought-after destination, a point of national pride, and now that pride has turned to shame. It has become a filthy, grotesque cesspit. Basically, the country's septic tank is California. Its cities smell like urine and weed, sidewalks covered in heroin needles and human fecal matter. Violent homeless drug addicts roam the lawless streets. It's in the midst of just total moral and financial collapse. And this is all thanks to the psychotic leftist regime that for so long has run the state and is now running it all the way into the ground, which explains the latest news out of California. You may have heard this reported by the Daily Wire earlier this week, quote, thousands of convicted pedophiles in California served less than a year in prison after committing lewd or lascivious acts with a child under 14 years old, according to an investigative Report. The Daily Mail analyzed a statewide database of sex offenders that showed more than 7,000 child molesters were released within months after federal authorities sentenced them to prison. Former Los Angeles sex crimes prosecutor Samuel Dor uh, Dordeleon told Daily Mail that the statistics shocked him, adding that the reality is frightening for society. Statistics clearly show that pedophiles don't get reformed, he said. They're going to come out and they're going to commit again. Letting these people out early were allowing for a lot more victimization, and that's terrifying. California law requires sex offenders to register their address and, and update their location upon moving with the Department of Justice. Those uh, names and other personal details are then placed in a public database under Megan's Law, which the Clinton administration passed in 1996 after a pedophile murdered seven-year-old Megan Kanka. Um, according to the report, 54,986 offenders were listed on the website in July 2019, of which 76% committed offenses involving children. The average pedophile served two years, sorry, two years and 10 months in prison. So almost got up to three years, but not quite. Now, the report in the Daily Mail also provides specific examples, naming names and uh, the crimes they committed. Back to the Daily Wire, it says one of the examples outlined in the Daily Mail Report uh, said that an offender in the database named Carlos Alexander Nahu, 48 of Rosetta, California, lives one block from Royal Montessori School daycare and three blocks from Rosetta Elementary School after allegedly being convicted of continuous sexual abuse of a child in 2015. Authorities charged Nahu in October 2014. He pled no contest to the crime in January 2015, which resulted in a judge sentencing him to only two days in a Los Angeles County jail and five years of probation. Two days. I mean, you could spend more time in jail for like a DUI. And this was the continuous sexual abuse of a child. Which, by the way, this is why I have a problem with the sex offender registry as a concept. 
Because if you're telling me that someone has been convicted of a sex crime and is a danger to offend again, which is the point of the registry, that's what necessitates the registry to let people know, oh, this dangerous person is out there and keep your kids away from him. Well, if that's the case, then this is someone who should not be released from prison in the first place. So the registry shouldn't exist because anyone who needs to be on it should simply be locked behind bars and then he's not our problem and we don't need to have his name on the registry. It's like we don't release serial killers from prison and then put their names on a serial killer registry. You don't, you don't put the serial killers back in the community and then say, hey, just so you know, here's a map with the red dots and those are where all the serial killers are. No, you keep them in prison. So why are we doing that with sex predators? Why are they being released in the first place? But this is no surprise in California. They believe that it is cruel and unjust to punish violent criminals. So instead, they punish law-abiding citizens by putting them in a position to be victimized by the violent criminals. And when it comes to violent criminals, California has a special soft spot for predators and groomers. After all, this is a state run by such people. As Charlie Kirk pointed out in a tweet thread yesterday, one of the most powerful and influential lawmakers in the state is a guy named Scott Weiner. That's a name you may recall because, well, it's funny, but also because Weiner is the man behind some of the most horrifically insane pieces of legislation this country has ever seen. Running through a few of them. For example, back in 2017, Weiner authored a, a, a bill to reduce the penalties for those who knowingly and intentionally expose a sex partner to HIV without telling them. So because of Wiener's legislation, willfully transmitting a deadly STD to another person is now a misdemeanor offense. It used to be a felony, and you get three to eight years in prison. If you willingly expose someone to HIV and don't tell them that you have it, you can go to prison. In the past, you go to prison for up to eight years for that. Um, he defended the law, the law that, uh, that gets rid of those penalties and makes a misdemeanor by, by insisting that well, modern medical treatments have dramatically lengthened the lives of those suffering from HIV, is what he said. So, so don't worry, he says. If somebody willfully infects you with the virus, it's okay, because your life will likely be shortened, but not shortened by as much as it used to be. And this is a sacrifice that you should be happy to make for the sake of allowing those with HIV to have unencumbered sex. Because, of course, in the, in the eyes of somebody like Scott Weiner and, uh, and really anyone else on the left, the, it's just... It is, a, it is an unthinkable form of oppression to tell someone that they should exercise any um, uh, caution or that there should be any restrictions at all on their sex life. The, the only point of living is just to have unencumbered sex all the time with whoever you want, whenever you want. That's the way that he looks at it. And so if people die in pursuit of that, then it's, it's a, it is a sacrifice worth making. Wiener, the same man who recently suggested that grade schools should have mandatory Drag Queen 101 classes, also spearheaded a bill signed into law a few uh, weeks ago, making California into a sanctuary state, quote unquote, for child gender transition. So parents who live in states where mutilation and castration on minors has been banned, they can kidnap their children and bring their children to the West Coast where they could be offered up as human sacrifices on the altar of gender ideology. And if you've got a situation where one parent wants to abuse their child in this way and the other parent desperately is trying to save their child from that kind of abuse, well, again, the, the, parent, the abusive parent can just kidnap the child, bring them to, uh, to California, and this will happen. And as part of this law, California has said that, um, you know, uh, that there, the, the, if other states are trying to arrest the parent doing this, that California is not going to cooperate with that. Now, that's not to say that Wiener considers parental involvement a necessity when it comes to medical treatments, quote unquote, medical treatments. Last year, after all, he wrote legislation permitting children as young as 12 to get the vaccine, the COVID vaccine, without parental consent. So protecting children is certainly not among Wiener's priorities. In 2020, perhaps most infamously, the California State Senate's uh, most prolific groomer, Scott Wiener, pushed through a bill to end, quote, discrimination against adults who have gay sex with minors. The law gives discretion to judges in cases where an adult engages in sodomy with a child who's at least 14 and no more than 10 years younger than himself. So for example, a 24-year-old man who abuses a 14-year-old boy 
would potentially benefit from Wiener's legislation. Wiener was saying, we don't want to discriminate against the predator in that case. So this is, in other words, a deeply evil man. And we haven't even mentioned his recent bill, ensuring that convicted violent male criminals will be housed with women if they claim to be women themselves. And in light of recent events, I think the defense that he offered, this is at a town hall, actually a recent town hall, where he's defending this idea that we should, if a, if a, a convicted male criminal says, I'm a woman, you put him in, lock him in a cage with uh, actual women. And he, he defends that. I want you to listen to what he says, because as I said, in, in, re, in light of recent events, this is kind of interesting. Listen. Unfortunately, there's been a right-wing backlash against this law, and we have right-wing publications that are publishing a lot of um, just inaccurate information, in fact, like fake news, um, about, uh, about this law and trying to demonize and scapegoat trans people, um, including, uh, unfortunately, um, there's a term called TERF, Trans Exclusive Radical Feminist, um, people who um, believe that trans women are not actually women, um, and, uh, and advocate in that way. Uh, they blockaded the London Pride Parade um, because to protest trans people being included in the Pride Parade. Um, and so it's just very unfortunate, these anti-transgender attacks. And so they're claiming that trans women are, gonna, are, are actually not real women and are men trying to scam their way into a women's prison to victimize women. These are the same arguments we heard in the North Carolina restroom law that trans women are just trying to scam their way into a women's restroom to victimize cisgender women. It's really unfortunate, but we're going to continue to work just to really support all of our marginalized communities here in California. Support the marginalized communities, except for the uh, women who are in prison and have basically no rights and have no ability to speak out and no way to defend themselves. So that's not a marginalized community he's interested in defending. But he does say it's an outlandish right-wing conspiracy theory that a man might claim to be a woman purely to manipulate and game the, the system. And yet, when the Colorado Springs gay club shooter last week revealed his own non-binary status, the left immediately assumed that he was claiming that identity purely to manipulate and game the system. So on one hand, that would never happen. They would never do that. And then, well, except in this case. The self-contradiction here seems indefensible. So how do they defend it? Indeed, how does someone like Scott Wiener defend any of what I've just laid out? Well, like this. So last night, Wiener, who I should remind you, is an elected lawmaker, tweeted this. Quote, not even 24 hours after MAGA grifter Charlie Kirk tweeted homophobic lies about me, I re and the lies, by the way, were just accurately laying out the bills that he has supported and authored and, and pushed through. Anyway, I received this threat repeating one of his lies, but that was the point, riling people up against me and other LGBTQ people. Words have consequences, and Twitter is becoming a cesspool for this crap. He does know a lot about cesspools, after all. He lives in one. He then provides a screenshot of this death threat. And here's what the death threat says. Quoting, it's a shame you come out and you're trying to release all these pedophiles. You're okay with people intentionally giving other people AIDS. And your office can't even pick up the phone to answer about these questions. You're sick, man. I don't even call you. You shouldn't even be a man. You're a sick individual. I don't care about what you do off hours. But when you try to force it upon California, it's like myself and others. You'll have, you'll have something coming to you. People like you won't be able to walk down the street when light comes to the darkness that you're effing providing, you piece of S. Okay, now there is one problem here, aside from how incoherent all that is. The problem is that, as you can see in the screenshot he provides, the cursor is, is clearly visible. You can see the cursor in the screenshot which obviously shows that he wrote the threat himself. You can also see the spell check underlines indicating grammatical errors, of which there are many in that uh, fake dead threat, which is obviously not something that appears on a message or email that you receive from somebody else. That's only there if you're writing it. I mean, at this point, I'm only surprised that he didn't accidentally sign the message with his own name. Maybe sign it, sincerely Scott Wiener, and then cross it out and write some other name and still post it. 
This is not only a hoax, but perhaps the laziest hoax we've seen yet, which is really saying something. It just, it continues to honestly amaze me that the left invents so many hoaxes and relies so heavily on them and yet still hasn't figured out how to make them even mildly believable. They also haven't developed convincing alibis. Some hours after this original tweet was posted and after conservatives started mocking him ruthlessly for it, he tweeted this follow-up. And by the way, speaking of conservatives mocking him for it, this thing was, was, was posted and, uh, and it, it took a few hours because, you know, conservatives, we don't typically check Scott Wiener's Twitter. So I think it took, it took us a few hours to even notice it. And in the intervening hours, you know, his own supporters were just commenting and say, oh, that's terrible. I can't believe they would say that. When the cursor is visible in the screenshot, they either are too stupid to notice that or just were willing to look over it. And I think it's probably more the latter, although some of the former too. So after conservatives noticed it, he, he then tweeted a follow-up. He said, for all the MAGA conspiracy theorists out there, the threat was a voicemail. This is a transcription. But have fun spinning around with your conspiracies. Sure, so someone calls in a death threat to his personal phone, to his office, he doesn't specify. And rather than post the audio of the call, which you could easily do, he writes out a transcript and then posts that instead and doesn't mention that it was a voicemail until everyone doubts his original story. Who could believe, who could disbelieve, rather, such a tale? Well, anybody with a brain, which means that he's pretty safe in California, of course. Now, in, in another universe, it, it might be shocking that a sitting state senator would casually and so blatantly invent a death threat as a means of silencing and, and his opposition, really silencing and defaming another person who he names. But in this universe, it's exactly what we've come to expect. Emotionalism is the only argument these people know. Self-victimization is their only rhetorical strategy. And the truth, of course, is irrelevant. Jussie Weiner may not have actually been the victim of this death threat, but, but you know, at some level, he feels like he was. And in our culture, of course, there's no difference between truth and feelings. Now let's get to our five headlines. Are you struggling to reach your fitness goals? As it turns out, having world-class instructors plus a community of hundreds of thousands of people who are working towards the same goal really helps. The guys at Echelon Fitness have it all worked out. Uh, Echelon Fitness is the, the affordable way to get workout equipment, a community, a workout community, and an instructor's motivation right in the comfort and privacy of your own home. Echelon Fitness's connected app provides thousands of live and on-demand classes with great music to keep you moving. You can work out anytime, day or night. Their full range of affordable workouts uh, equipment includes stationary bikes, smart rowers, sleek fitness screens, and an auto-folding treadmill. These are all connected to the Echelon Fitness app for the full experience. Around-the-clock classes, including full-body workout programs, will keep you coming back. One membership covers a family of five. So for a limited time, my audience can get a free bike or rowing machine with a 24-month membership. To get your free bike or rower, text MATT to 818181. That's MATT to 818181 to claim your free bike or rowing machine. Text MATT to 818181. Message and data rates may apply. See terms for details. All right, I almost don't even want to move past that because it's so, I, I, I feel like I should spend the entire, I won't, don't worry, but I, it's worth an entire show. It's like worth an entire week of shows. I, I, we, <laughs> faking a death threat and then taking a screenshot with the cursor still visible. It's one of the greatest, it's one of the funniest things I think I, that's, that I've ever seen. It's just, it's incredible. But then what makes it so depressing is that it's also sort of, as I said, not incredible. It's, it's, it should be more incredible than it is. And since we're on the subject of, uh, of hoaxes, you know, I was thinking about this. In fact, I saw someone tweeting about it last night before, the, uh, before um, Scott uh, Smollett leapt into action. But you may remember a couple weeks ago, in fact, during the Daily Cancellation, I mentioned this story about a noose that was discovered at the, a so-called noose, was discovered at the Obama Presidential Center construction site in Chicago. And there's still, because you know, because of all the red tape and bureaucracy, it takes 65 years to build anything anymore. 
and they're still working. They're not even like they're they're barely past. Uh, you know, they're still in the early stages of building his presidential center. And the story was that, and this was back on, there's a CNN report. This is back on November 11th. The story is that somebody found a noose at the construction site and they shut everything down and everybody involved was issuing apologies and the mayor and the governor spoke out and they condemned it and said, this is an act of hate. And then as we talked about the daily cancellation, you know, far be it for me to, to, cast uh, any doubt whatsoever on a story like this, but I, I did point out that, um, of course, we we hear about nooses being discovered all the time, and in, in, in literally every single case, I mean, as in 100% of the time, it turns out to be a hoax, or either a deliberate hoax or someone, uh, a very stupid person just sees an innocent rope, like a Bubba, a Bubba Wallace situation, uh, and that was, you know, how... To what level was that his stupidity versus deliberate, you know, that's, we could debate it. Someone sees an innocent rope and then misinterprets it, but that's 100% of the time it's one of those two things. Um, and then I also pointed out how this actually happens a lot in construction sites. There's like been this, and the media has reported on it, this rash, this mysterious epidemic of nooses being found on construction sites. It happens a lot. Entire construction projects are shut down because someone finds a noose. And then what do you then what what do you know? A few weeks later, it turns out that oh well, it was just a rope because this is a construction site, and a rope is a tool that is often used in construction. And sometimes, believe it or not, the ropes will be tied into like some kind of a knot. And also, believe it or not, not every knot is a noose. There are other forms of knots. You learn this if you were in the Boy Scouts, which I wouldn't recommend being in the Boy Scouts anymore. So going back to the Obama, Obama Presidential Center, so this was two weeks ago. Everything was shut down because of this hate crime news. There was a $100,000 reward offered for information about the news. Two weeks later, we've heard nothing about it. I just looked up for, for an update. I went to Google, searched any news article that's been written about it in the past week, and nothing. Nothing. And this is the way that it always goes. It's going to be the same thing with the death threat to... Uh, to Scott Wiener. We hear about it and then, uh, oh, this is terrible, condemnations, and we're going to look into this, we're going to investigate, and then that's the last you ever hear about. All right. Here's another update on a, on a, on a story. Uh, this is from the Daily Mail as well. It says, the Biden administration's non-binary nuclear waste guru was a presenter at a fetish conference in LA weeks after admitting to stealing a woman's suitcase at the Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport. Last Saturday, Sam Britton, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Office of Spent Fuel and Waste Disposition, who could be facing five years in prison for the bag theft, presented a seminar titled Spanking from Calculus to Chemistry. The seminar was held at Westin Bonaventure Hotel and Suites in Los Angeles, where, of course, in Los Angeles, where Britain 34 stayed on Friday and Saturday night. The event was titled L.A. Leather Getaway and was sponsored by Claw Corporation, a national leather charity. A national leather charity. So is this like they donate leather bondage gear to BDSM fans in need? Is that, is that what this is? Britain, who presented at the event under the pseudonym Nuclear Nerd, has been teaching their their has been teaching their physics of kink class at universities and communities uh, uh, events across the country for years, according to their bio, uh, profile on Claw's website. The bio goes on to say they have been active in the kink world since 2013. They host monthly kink parties in their dungeon in Washington D.C. and estimate that they have spanked over 2,000 butts. I'm regretting even reading this. So he actually, he's keeping a body count of the number of uh, asses that he has spanked. And this person was given a position, a, a high-ranking position, let's not forget, in the Department of Energy. And given, I believe, don't quote me on this, the highest security clearance available to somebody in the department, or one of the highest at the very least. Um. Now, we should note that the other update to the story is that the, he has been placed on leave after this incident with stealing the bag. But that's revealing on a couple of levels because, um, number one, 
the bag was stolen and the police found out about it and, and, and charges were filed weeks ago. This, this all happened weeks ago. It's not until the public finds out that the Biden administration places this person on leave. But it's also revealing because, so s- stealing a woman's bag, which, which yes, is, is bad and, and creepy on many levels, especially because we know why he stole it, was, was almost certainly to steal the clothes and wear the woman's clothing because he's a freak. Um, yeah, that's, that's bad, but that's what gets him placed on leave. You know, the fact that he runs a sex dungeon in Washington, D.C., that, that's not enough to do it. Going and, and attending, uh, or, or rather hosting and teaching at fetish classes and giving spanking classes, that, that's not enough to make you second guess? Um, no, of course not. You know, there was, now, one thing, of course, is that Sam Britton is certainly not the first deviant fetishist to work in Washington, D.C. We can, we can certainly say that. He absolutely is not the first. The difference is that he's so open about it. And that we're supposed to celebrate this. And this is what happens when, you know, you, we are forced, as we talked about a few days ago, to not just affirm someone's self-perceptions and self-identity, as bad as that is, but now we have to go even further and we are told we have to affirm even someone's fetish. Their, you know, sexual deviances and all the rest of it. All right, a couple of weeks ago, the New York Times published an article questioning the use of puberty blockers for children. And uh, we talked about that on the show. And, and, of course, they were not outright condemning the use of puberty blockers, as they should, obviously. But they were questioning it. And that is at least some amount of progress. It's not progress that we should congratulate the New York Times for when they're a decade late to the party and they still lack the courage to come just come and outright say what they obviously know to be true, which is that we should not be doing this to any kids at all. Instead, they said, you know, uh, certainly there are times when this is necessary and it's, uh, this is a, a medical procedure that's approved by many, but there are questions. We should be asking questions. Now, the world... Um, the uh, WPATH, which is the, the, the biggest transgender health organization in the world, they have finally responded. It took them, took them a couple of weeks, but they finally responded to that New York Times article. And they issued a lengthy statement. I'm not going to read the entire thing because there's no reason really to read it. Most of, of, uh, of their article just centers around questioning the credentials of the people who are quoted in the New York Times article. Because that's all these people can ever do. That's always what it comes down to, right? Every single argument comes down to credentialism, appeals to authority. So that's all they did for for, for most of their their response. But then there's this part. I want you to listen to this. WPATH says, the blockers themselves do not impact bone density. This is one of the big claims, accurate claims, that the New York Times made in that article is that it has, uh, it has, it damages bones, it damages bone density, and all the rest of it. They say, the blockers themselves do not impact bone density. Bone density is impacted by the fact that sex steroid production is temporarily halted when puberty blockers are initiated. Now, hang on a second. Let's go back and read that again, because I'm a little confused. The blockers themselves do not impact bone density, Bone density is impacted by the fact that sex sex steroid production is temporarily halted when puberty blockers are initiated. In other words, they do impact bone density. We'll go back to that in a second, but let's keep reading. The adolescent in this anecdote was already using estrogen, which promotes bone health. Therefore, the point about stopping blockers due to bone density loss is moot. Many types of blockers are routinely used in combination with estrogen well through adulthood without deleterious effects on bone density. This has been the common practice for treatment of adult transgender individuals for decades. But for, of adult, notice they're saying adult. Bone density loss is generally not a concern once hormone therapy has begun. In fact, Dr. Kosla's paper states that, quote, the skeleton should be relatively well protected assuming adequate compliance with hormone therapy. Now, 
that in and of itself is not ex- doesn't sound to me to be a ringing endorsement of puberty blockers. Well, the skeleton should be relatively well protected. What kind of parent, what, 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 kind of, what kind of sane and actually loving parent could hear that from a doctor and then decide to go through with it anyway? Yes, we're going to give your child this medically unnecessary uh, drug for cosmetic reasons. And as far as their bones, you know, your child's bones, uh, his skeleton should be relatively well protected. But going back to the very beginning, this, this is the game that these people play, and, they, and they, they get away with it. Because, of course, no one in the corporate media, nobody on the left is going to criticize them or put them under any scrutiny, and a lot of people on the right are too afraid to, and so they get away with this kind of thing. And it is, it is outrageous. They get away with making the claim. This is not going to be fact-checked. You know, Twitter's not fact-checking in this. This, this, is not, this is not going to go through any of the fact-checkers. And this is not going to be misinformation, context needed. No, this is, they're allowed to say this. Not only that, but actually, this is going to be used, I guarantee it. Maybe not on Twitter anymore, I hope not, but uh, certainly on Facebook and the other platforms. This statement from WPATH will be used to fact-check conservatives when, who are criticizing gender ideology. They're not going to take this statement. Rather than fact-checking the statement, the statement itself will be used as a fact-check against people who are criticizing gender ideology. And yet, what are they saying here? The blockers don't impact bone density. Bone density is impacted by the fact that steroid production is, is temporarily halted. So the blockers don't impact density, but the, the blockers have an effect on the body, which then impacts bone density. So it's not the blockers themselves that are impacting bone density. It's what the blocker is doing to the body that impacts bone density. Now, you may ask, what the hell is the distinction there? There is no distinction. Okay, this is, it's not even a distinction. It's just a different way of phrasing the exact same thing. And again, they get away with it. All right. Uh, meanwhile, Christopher Rufo has this report. It says, the new animated film for kids, Mama Has a Mustache, is sponsored by AbbVie, which is the pharmaceutical company that sells the chemical castration drug Lupron to convicted pedophiles and, quote, transgender children. A little bit more on this um, animated film, which is sponsored not just by this pharmaceutical company, but by others as well. But first, let's watch the, uh, I guess this is the trailer for this piece of propaganda. Watch. Can you be a girl and have a boy body? Or be a boy and have a girl body? Yes. That's transgender. Can this person be a parent? Yes. My dad. I feel like I'm not really a boy or a girl. Because the God is in me. I love myself. Mama has a mustache. Mommy has a mustache. Hmm. By the way, I was curious about the film itself, this propaganda film, and um, I tried, went to look up where where can you find it. Um, not that it's a, a a something that I would enjoy watching, but it is something that I'm I'm interested to see for the purposes of debunking it. And uh, you, it's it's not available. Like you have to. Uh, they kind of keep it under lock and key. They're not making it widely available to everybody, which is uh, not a surprise because that's exactly what they don't want. What exactly what they don't want is someone like me watching it and going through it and picking, up, uh, picking it apart. Um, so you can access it, but you got to go, you got to sign, you have to basically fill like an application form to, to access the film. Although we've seen enough from it just based on that. Uh, and it, it, it will never fail to just absolutely disgust and infuriate me when um, I see any kind of propaganda like this, but especially, you know, you hear the child, hear one of the children, one of the abused children being exploited for this thing, say, uh, uh, well, I, I love myself, which is good, right? Because you should love yourself. And we should teach our, kid, our children to love themselves and accept themselves for who they are. Um, that's an important message. Because the other option is, self-loathing. The other option is to reject, to want to reject who you naturally are. 
and yes, we should be we should be teaching our kids to love themselves. But that is is exactly what this kind of propaganda does not teach. It teaches the opposite. Under the guise of loving yourself, it actually teaches kids to hate themselves, to hate who they are, to 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 try to destroy who they actually are, with drugs and surgery if necessary. For the, the sake of obtaining some kind of image, an image that they didn't even come up with, an image that was given to them by the propagandists, by the groomers. Uh, Breitbart has more on this story. It says a pro-transgender propaganda film for children called Mama Has a Mustache was sponsored by Bayer, a um, pharmaceutical company that produces drugs that are used to feminize men who identify as transgender. Mama Has a Mustache is all about normalizing transgenderism, particularly in the minds of one group of people, and that is young children. The film's website bears the phrase, kids talk gender directly above the trailer, which starts with the child being asked, can you be a girl and have a boy body or be a boy and have a girl body? We heard that. Um, the synopsis of Mama Has a Mustache leaves no room for doubt about the film's intentions to mold the minds of young children. The film is driven completely by audio interviews of kids ages 5 to 10 and explores how children are able to experience a world outside of the traditional gender binary. And of course, we're supposed to be getting uh, the child's perspective, but we're not actually getting the child's perspective. We're getting the child, these children, repeating the propaganda that's been fed to them. So we're getting adult disseminated propaganda fed through the mouths of children. Kids didn't come up with any of this. Kids, kids didn't come up with, with uh, gender identity. Kids didn't come up with the idea that you could be a, boy, a girl in a boy's body. No, no child developed that idea. That was developed by the groomers and the predators, and kids are being made to repeat it. But the point here is that you've got, it seems, at least two pharmaceutical companies that are behind this film that have helped to sponsor it. Um, and... We see again where the left's, uh, you know, they're, they're, the, this pose they strike of being critical of corporations and skeptical of big money influence and all of that, all of that reveals itself to be just that, a pose. It all, that's all it is. I wish it were true. You know, and I think for a long time the right bought into this too much. They bought into this, uh, you know, this, this, this notion that the left is like demonizing corporations and demonizing rich people. And I think simply demonizing corporations, demonizing rich people is simplistic. But I wish that it was true. I wish that that was, I, I wish that was the mistake that the left made. It's like being overly simplistic in their, in their uh, condemnations of money and rich people and corporations. I wish that was true. But it's not true at all, of course. Because if you are going to be skeptical of billion-dollar corporations... Um, the first place you should be looking and the first place where you should be directing that skepticism is to the pharmaceutical industry. Doesn't mean all, all drugs that uh, the pharmaceutical industry produces are bad, necessarily. I think a lot of them are. They're not all bad. But this is a multi-billion dollar industry that um, makes all that money, not just by, not just by uh, treating sickness, but by convincing people they are sick so that they can then treat it. And this comes in many forms, uh, and it includes most nefariously and insidiously the uh, you know, convincing children that they're sick with this gender dysphoria so that then can be treated by the drugs they provide. All right, let's see. There's one other thing I wanted to mention before we get to the comment section. Daily Wire has this story. Kathleen Casillo is a mother of three from Queens, New York, was Christmas shopping with her daughter in Manhattan on December 11th, 2020, when she drove up to an intersection filled with protesters blocking the road to impose, to oppose rather, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement detentions. On Tuesday, she again rejected a plea deal that would admit fault but only require six hours of community service and a one-year license suspension. Casillo, or probably Casillo, uh, instead has opted for a jury trial where she faces seven years in prison if found guilty. She rejected the same plea deal last year, according to the New York Post. In video footage that captured part of the incident, Casillo's black BMW can be seen surrounded by protesters, some of whom appear to be touching or banging on her vehicle. Casillo then stepped on the gas and sped through the group, injuring nine. 
Sia told the Mail last year, my side of the story was we were attacked by people who were going to break my daughter's window and pull her out of the car, so I feared for my life. Uh, I'm going to court to clear my name because I'm not guilty. I feel sick, she continued. I never intended on hurting anyone. I just feared for my daughter's life more than anybody. I thought they were going to pull her out of the car. And, and, uh, and rightfully so, did she fear for her daughter's life. I mean, it's, it's not as though there's, there are no examples of that happening. I think this, this woman, I don't know anything else, anything else about her besides what I just read in the article, but this is, this is like, this takes some real courage. Because they, they're, they're saying, okay, six hours of community service will suspend your license. That's not a small deal to get your license suspended. But she's willing to, she's going to turn that down. She's willing to risk years in prison for the sake of clearing her name and standing by the truth. Uh, it's a real risk there, but it takes a lot of guts, takes a lot of courage. And you, ha- you have to respect that. And I, I think it also shows you that, you know, the prosecutors realize they don't have a case. Like if they thought they had a case and that this woman really was just some crazed lunatic, uh, guilty of, uh, you know, attempted murder, essentially, plowing down protesters or whatever. If they thought, if they, thought they had any way of winning that, then they would be charging with that. But instead, they're offering her six hours of community service because they know they don't have a case. Um, and even if she's innocent, which is clear to me that she is, does that mean that she'll actually be found not guilty in court? Well, that, of course, remains to be seen. But in reality, you know, first of all, nobody has any right to block a roadway. You don't, you don't have any right to do that. Okay? Um, it's not like she's driving the car into, your, into the front of your house. You're sitting in your living room and you get hit. They're sitting blocking the road. They have no right to do that. Now, these left-wing protesters have been empowered in this way and have been told that they have the right to just, you know, block, invade restaurants, burn things down, loot, whatever, block. Blocking a road is the least of it. And the more they're in power, the more it leads to incidents like this. But they don't actually have any right to do that. And when you're being surrounded by this hostile group of maniacs, then you have every right to fear for your life. This is, this is a life-threatening situation. You have a child in the car. Absolutely. Step on the gas. Without hesitation. That's the right move. All right, let's get now to the comment section. If you're a man, it's required that you grow a beard. Hey, we're the sweet baby gang. A hard year on the economy means that essential practical gifts will be in high demand this year. You can give the most essential gift of all, America's best meat and seafood from Good Ranchers. With discounts on orders of five boxes or more, you can save on gifts for the whole family. When you give a box of Good Ranchers, you're giving them a true steakhouse experience with 100% American USDA prime and uppercut choice, choices of, a, of a beef, chicken, and seafood. Other meat delivery companies and even your local grocery store imports lower quality meat from overseas. Don't give your friends and family less than America's best this year. Not sure what to order? Well, Good Ranchers now offers gift cards so you can let your friends and family members choose for themselves or you can give the gift of a subscription and inflation-proof someone's meat budget at the same time. Go to GoodRanchers.com and use code Walsh at checkout to get $35 off your gift. That's GoodRanchers.com, code Walsh for $35 off. Good Ranchers, American meat delivered. You know, uh, my wife, the one thing about her is that she doesn't like to make things easy on herself. And um, I've never quite understood this. I, you know, I don't know if it's a, if there's a little bit of the a gender difference here or what, but um, cause I keep trying to tell her, like, make life easier on yourself to any extent that you can. We, we're going to have six kids now. So the, the life's difficulty setting is already, I'm not going to say it's high, as high as it can get, but it's already pretty high. Like six kids un, all under the age of nine, all nine and under. That's a pretty high difficulty setting. Um, I don't think you need to, you know, you don't need to complicate it any more than it already is. And that's been what I'm always preaching, but it doesn't always resonate. So um, she chooses the hard way sometimes. So, so like for instance, yesterday, last night, we put the kids down for bed and, um, she comes into the living room and she's all like exhausted. I mean, she's, she's, she's very pregnant at this point with twins. So she's exhausted. She's exasperated. And I asked her what's wrong. And she said, well, I had to move the elves around. And I said, elves. And she said, yeah, elf on a shelf. And I said, oh, great. We're doing that again. And then I said, but what do you mean is elf on a shelf? It's singular, elf on a shelf. And she said, oh, no, no, it's, it's, see, what she informed me is that, is that this year, 
for reasons that have still not been explained, each of our kids have their own elf. They each have their own elf on a shelf. And I'm not making this up. This is, this is real. The elves also have pets. So this is a thing now with the elf on the shelf thing. You got the elves and then the elves have their own, have like little puppies. And so we've got four elves for all the kids that are for all the born children. I'm surprised you didn't get two for the unborn children too. And then the elves have pets. And so the elves have to be moved and the pets have to be moved. Every night for the next month. And I was just trying to ask her, why would you do this? What, what, why? Well, it's fun for the kids. Yeah, it's, but it's not even that fun. Yeah, it's fun for the kids, but you have to measure that it's the, the misery and uh, hassle for you versus fun for the kids. And, you know, sometimes fun for the kids wins out, but you, we, we got to strike a balance here. The other thing, too, is I don't even think the older kids believe the elf thing anymore. I'm almost certain they know that we're the ones, well, not me, I don't do it. I'm, I'm almost certain they know that my wife is the one moving the elf around, and, but they just enjoy the spectacle. And so they're letting her continue to do it. And my God. Um, all right. Philip has this. LOL, how quickly people forget that Bob Iger was the one who started pouring, uh, started, this is small, who started pouring on the woke at full speed before leaving. Who thinks this was a victory? Uh, that's why I said, Phil, that it's, it's, it, this is not a complete victory. You know, the, the clips we played of Bob Iger, who's the new CEO, the old CEO, and now the new CEO of Disney, seemingly sort of backing away from, the, from, uh, from politics and backing away from this war between Disney and DeSantis. So I said, it's not, it's not, it's not an absolute, total, final victory. I'm under no illusion that uh, Disney is going to become anti-woke or conservative. They start churning out all this conservative content. Nobody's saying that. But they are backing away from the fight, okay? And that is a it's, a, it's a victory in the battle. And there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that. I think as conservatives, actually, that's something we should be doing more often. Uh, you don't want to rest on your laurels. You have a victory. You don't want to just kind of congratulate yourself and then give up at that point and, and, and think that the war is over. But when there is a, a, a win, however minor, it's, it's a good thing to acknowledge that. Um, as opposed to this kind of doom saying that I certainly can be guilty of quite often, where it's just like there's never any victories, nothing is ever any good, nothing is, is, is we're always losing. I think after a while it becomes a defeatist mentality, and uh, that's what I'm worried about here. All right. Ed says, clarification for Matt. Not long ago, a close friend of mine went to a hospital for a non-COVID-related health problem. He was taken to the ER for some reason and then assigned a bed elsewhere in the hospital. Turns out it was the COVID ward that needed to fill the COVID ward for financial reasons. When he said he was leaving, the hospital security force, whatever that is, said that they would stop my friend for his own good. Finally, one lawyer and two ex-military friends later, uh, my friend left the hospital and the staff cursed him and hurled insults. Please do not trust the police or anyone to determine who needs to go to the hospital. Yeah, and there were a few comments like this uh, re relating to, you know, New York City has said that it's now going to start um, involuntarily committing mentally ill, dangerous mentally ill people. And this was uh, my point, Ed, as well, that, yeah, it's, it's on the surface, in theory, that's the right thing to do. We used to have mental asylums that used to be a thing, and there's a place for those in society because there are crazy people out there who are dangerous, and um, we're either going to protect society and protect them from themselves by committing them, or we're just going to allow them to run free, you know, in the streets. And we see what that happens in places. What what happens because of that in places like New York? But the fear is that um, you're entrusting this power to the government, and especially a government like the one that runs New York. Um, and it's easy to see how that could be abused when they get to determine what constitutes a mental illness and what constitutes a danger to society. Uh, Joe says, your ability to weasel your way out of an uncomfortable commitment on a ridiculous technicality is admirable. Well, thank you, Joe. Elizabeth says, we have to stop letting Matt get out of his deals on technicalities. Landon says, come on, Matt. That was a bit of a cop-out. I really need to see Internet Dad watch a season of Japan's Finest. Okay, I, I know, look, I know you're not satisfied. I get it. 
There are a lot of comments like that. Some people, in fact, were very upset. Um, I did yesterday, I did watch a season of anime. So that according, maybe not the spirit of the deal, but according to the letter of the law, the letter, you know, what we signed on the dotted line, I, I fulfilled my obligation. But here's the good news. If that wasn't good enough for you, somebody else, another member of the SBG, has made a different anime, and this one is literally twice as long as the one yesterday, okay? Twice as long. That's how long it is. Twice as long. And I think that you will agree that uh, if we watch this one together, it will fulfill my responsibility and my obligation, and I will have lived up to my end of the deal. So this is called The Adventures of Amutsuman. And uh, which you can you can find this on on YouTube. It's a wonderful uh, anime video, and, and this is a you know this is an anime, and well let's watch it. Go ahead. Put the card away. It's really not that difficult. Oh, it's a season one, episode one. So it that so they, 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 this, this person didn't understand the assignment completely. But that's supposed to be the entire season. But but still, I I thought. Look, I actually do. So that these are this two anime shows now, two in a row that I personally really like. And I thought that I thought the voice acting first of all in this one was tremendous. Um, as much as I loved the uh, anime from yesterday, I thought this one. Uh, I I thought the plot was uh, was even more absorbing. And it was a little bit long for my taste. It kind of, I, I felt that it dragged just a little bit. Uh, it had some slower parts, but it, but it also, it, you know, you, you got You got to, you have to be, slow down the pace a little bit too to get more absorbed into the story. And um, I thought that the character arc was was uh, really well executed. I just thought it was re- really really good. So yet again, I'm going to give that uh, an A plus. And so I have now fulfilled my obligation not once but twice. And if that's not good enough for you, then I, I don't know what to tell you. The season of giving is officially upon us, but as you shop holiday gifts of, uh, and deals, you should ask yourself, who exactly are you giving to? Because if you're buying stocking stuffers from woke companies, you're really just stuffing the pockets of leftist CEOs and paying them to mock your values. Don't give them your money. Give Jeremy your money. His brand new collection of Jeremy's Razor products will make the perfect gift for the pronounless men in your life. And today is the last day of his 30% uh, cyber sale. So get your loved ones some woke free shampoo and conditioner, body wash, beard kit, or the new Precision 5 razor with flip back trimmer before Jeremy merrily restores list pricing. So go to jeremysrazors.com for your last chance to save. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Well, if you saw the first Avatar films, then um, you probably don't need any additional incentive to not watch the upcoming sequels from director James Cameron, who uh, hasn't made a decent film in about, I guess it's been probably 20 years. Of course, the original Avatar back in uh, 2009 was a a massive multi-billion dollar hit, but that was due mostly to this period of mass societal psychosis that caused millions of people to believe temporarily that it was a good film. It was a very bewildering time for people like myself who never fell under this hypnotic trance. Um, Eventually, though, everyone woke up from their hallucinogenic stupor and realized that Avatar was, despite the special effects, one of the least interesting and least inventive films ever released. It was essentially just Disney's Pocahontas, but with blue people and less singing. It was a film so lacking in wit and creativity that the natural resource that everyone is fighting over in the film, you know, it centers around this natural resource, and it's called unobtainium because, you know, it's difficult to obtain. That, that's the level of writing we got in this film. It was the kind of film where the bad guy is an evil army officer with a scar on his face who's motivated to do bad things because, you know, he's the evil bad guy, and that's what evil guys do. And I would continue in my critique of the movie, but it was so utterly forgettable that there isn't much else I can really say about it. Um, I will say that it was uh, one of the only times in my life that I almost walked out of a movie in the theater. 
The only reason I didn't is that I actually fell asleep. And it's it's and this is true. It's the only movie I've ever felt. I've, I missed like 45 minutes because I took a nice nap. Thank God. All of this to say, the sequel set to be released in a couple of weeks is guaranteed to be terrible. Now, almost all sequels are terrible, even sequels to good films. But sequels to bad films are doomed from the start because they're building from a foundation of crap. And yet, judging from the director's recent public statements, this sequel may well be awful in ways that exceed our wildest expectations. So here's the story from the New York Post. It says, James Cameron has revealed that his long-awaited Avatar sequel is rooted in his personal issues. Quote, I thought I'm going to work out a lot of my stuff artistically that I've gone through as a parent of five kids. Cameron, 68, told The Hollywood Reporter, the overarching idea is that the family is the fortress. It's our greatest weakness and our greatest strength. I thought, I can write the hell out of this. I know what it is to be the a-hole dad. Now, if somehow a big budget sequel to the most overrated film of all time made as a means for the 68-year-old director to work out his personal issues seems appealing to you, then um, wait until you hear the rest of it. Quote, reflecting back on his career, which includes highly publicized clashes with studio executives, Cameron said, a lot of things I did earlier I wouldn't do career-wise, and just risks that you take as a wild, testosterone-poisoned young man. I always think of testosterone as a toxin that you have to slowly work out of your system. Well, good news, James. It seems that you've mostly succeeded in that regard. Nobody will accuse you of having excess testosterone. But for the record, um, testosterone is not a poison, nor is it a toxin, nor is it something that you want to work out of your system. It is, in fact, a hormone vital to growth and vital to development, which maintains, among other things, your bone density, your muscle mass, strength. Of course, the irony here is that if you asked him about the subject, James Cameron, as a Hollywood leftist, would almost certainly tell you that he's a fan of gender affirmation drugs and procedures, which means that in his world, testosterone is only a poison when it's naturally produced. Testosterone in the form of a drug given to gender-confused girls is, uh, is wonderful, um, and it's medically necessary and affirmative, but if it's naturally produced by men, then it's bad. And yet Cameron is really only guilty of being overly honest here, if anything, because this is how our society generally treats men and boys. Young men are poisoned by the toxin of testos- tos- testosterone, we're told. That's the essence of toxic masculinity, after all. And, and, you know, it's, it's true that young men in particular can be wild, can be aggressive, um, can be prone to risk-taking and confrontation. Testosterone, indeed, plays a big role in that. But our approach as a culture should be to help these boys and young men harness their masculine energy, not suppress it or purge themselves of it or drug it out of them, but help them to develop the character and discipline to funnel all of that testosterone-fueled aggression and energy in a constructive and worthwhile direction. You know, this is one of the many things our society gets wrong when it comes to men. Boys, as they grow up, um, they're not given proper outlets. And most of the outlets that they once had are being taken away. Even things like the, you know, more aggressive and and, um, sort of violent games Kids used to play on playgrounds. We don't play those games anymore. Take all that away. They're not trained on how to harness this energy. They're not trained on how to be men. They're so often deprived of competent male role models. We are fearful of masculinity, and so we demand that boys essentially act like girls, and sometimes we literally try to turn them into girls. And then as they get older and stronger and become unruly and violent, we conclude that masculinity itself must be the problem rather than a lack of guidance, a lack of leadership, a lack of moral formation. And then the goal becomes, as James Cameron puts it, to purge uh, masculinity, to work it out, to eradicate it. And now he's made a movie about it, which, you know, you can watch if you don't value your brain or your time or your money. But I will decline the invitation for my part and uh, instead say to James Cameron that you, sir, are today canceled. And that'll do it for this portion of the show as we move over to the members block. Hope to see you there. If not, talk to you tomorrow. Godspeed.